Alright guys, so my name is Noah Williamson and I have a YouTube channel, Noah Bai. And um, so what I'm planning on doing is I'm going to live stream me reading this book, What is Reformed Theology by R.C. Sproul. Got it for free and I want to read it and I decided to make a video about it They're with you guys all right so what is reformed theology understanding the basics by R.C. Sproul what do the five points of Calvinism really mean this is the back of the book there are a lot of misconceptions in popular culture in the church regarding reformed theology some re some references to it are positive some negative it's time for a full, understandable explanation of what it really is and why it matters. What is Reformed Theology? It is an accessible, an accessible introduction to a set of beliefs and concepts that have been immensely influential in the evangel ev ev evangelic <sighs> evangelic church, ev evangelical church. In this insightful book, R.C. Sproul walks you through the foundations of Reformed doctrine and explains how the Reformed belief is centered on God, based on God's word, and committed to faith in Jesus Christ. Spro Sproul explains the five points of Reformed theology and makes it plain the reality of God's amazing grace. R.C. Sproul has served the church as a seminary professor, pastor, and author of more than 90 books. He is the founder and chairman of Legionnaire Ministries, and his teaching can be heard on the radio program, Renewing Your Mind, which is broad, which broadcasts daily on more than 300 radio outlets in the United States in more than 50 countries. So R.C. Sproul, he actually, I think he's, I'm pretty sure he's dead. Um, but yeah, this is one of the books that he read, that he wrote. And so yeah, I'm just going to read this to you guys and feel, feel free to comment something. <laughs> yeah, thanks for watching this. So introduction. Reformed theology is a theology. What is Reformed theology? The purpose of this book is to provide a simple answer to this question. What is Reformed theology? It's not a textbook on systematic theology, nor a detailed, com comprehensible, comprehensive exposition of each and every article of Reformed of, of Re Reformation doctrine. It is instead a compendium, a shorthand introduction to the crystallized essence of Re Reformation theology. 18th century, theologian, theologians and historians, busy with a comparative analysis of world religions, sought to distill the essence of religion itself and reduce Christianity to its least common denominator. The term Wesson, being or essence, appeared in a plethora of German theological studies, including Adolf Harnack's book, What is Christianity? Harnack reduced Christianity to two essential affirm affirmations, the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man neither of which is is espoused by the bible in the sense articulated by harnack a theology not a religion this movement to reduce religion to its essence had a subtle subtle but dramatic effect the study of religion supplemented su supplanted the study of theology in the academic world this change was subtle in that to the general po populace, religion and theology were the same thing, so people felt no dramatic impact, 
Even in the academic world, the shift was widely accepted with barely a whimper. Several years ago, I was invited to, to address the faculty of a prominent Midwestern college with a rich Christian and a reformed tradition. The school was without president and the faculty was engaged in a self-study to define the college's identity. They asked me to address this question, what are, the, what are the distinctives of a uniquely Christian education? Before my lecture, the dean showed me around the campus. and we entered the facility, the faculty office building, I noticed one office with these words stenciled on the door, Department of Religion. That evening, I spoke to the faculty. I said, during my tour of your, your facility, I noticed an office door that announced Department of Religion. My question is twofold. First, was that department always called a Department of Religion? My inquiry was greeted by silence and blank stares. At first, I thought no one was able to answer my question. Finally, an elder st statesman of the faculty raised his hand and said, no, it used to be called Department of Theology. We changed it about 30 years ago. Why did you change it? I asked. No one in the room had any idea, nor did they seem to care. The, the, tactic, the tacit assumption was, it doesn't really matter. I reminded the faculty that there is a profound difference between the study of theology and the study of religion. Historically, the study of religion has been subsumed under the headings of anthropology, sociology, and or even psychology. The, the academic investigation of religion has sought to be grounded in a scientific empirical method. The reason for this is quite simple. Human activity is part of the phenomenal world. It is activity that is visible, subject to empirical analysis. Psychology may not be as concrete as biology, but human behavior in response to beliefs, urges, opinions, and so forth can be studied in accordance with the scientific method. To state it more simply, the study of religion is chiefly the study of a certain kind of human behavior, be it under the rubric of anthropology, sociology, or psychology. The study of theology, on the other hand, is the study of God. Religion is anthropocentric. Theology is theocentric. The difference between religion and theology is ultimately the difference between God and man, hardly a small difference. Again, it is a difference of subject matter. The subject matter of theology proper is God. The subject matter of religion is man. A major objection to this simplification may arise immediately. Doesn't the study of theology involve the study of what human beings say about God? The study of scripture. We answer this question with one word. Partially. We study theology in several ways. The first is by studying the Bible. Historically, the Bible was received by the church as a normative depository of divine revelation. Its ultimate author was thought to be God himself. This is why the Bible is called the Verbum Dei. Word of God, or Vox Dea, Voice of God. It was considered to be the product of divine self-disclosure. The, inf the information contained with it comes not as a result of human empirical investigation or human speculation, but by supernatural revelation. It is called revelation because it comes from the mind of God to us. Historically, Christians claim to be and was received as revealed truth, not truth discovered via human insight or ingenuity. Paul begins his epistle to the Romans with these words. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. 
Romans 1 11. What does the phrase gospel of God mean? Does the word of indicate possession or does it simply mean about? Is Paul saying that the gospel is something about God or something from God? Historic Christianity would consider these questions an exercise in the fallacy of the false dilemma or the either or fallacy. Classical Christianity would say that the gospel is a message that is both about God and from God. At that same time, the church has always recognized that the Bible was not written by the finger of God. God did not write a book and have it published by the celestial publishing company and then drop it to earth by parachute. The church has always acknowledged that the scriptures were composed and written by human authors. The burning issue today is this. Were these human authors writing their own unaided opinions and insights, or were they uniquely endowed as agents of revelation, writing under the inspiration and superintendence of God? If we say that the Bible is a product of only human opinion and insight, we can still speak about biblical theology in the sense that the Bible contains human teachings about God, but we can no longer speak about biblical revelation. If God is the ultimate author of the Bible, we can speak of both biblical revelation and biblical theology. If man is the ultimate author, then we are restricted to speaking about biblical theology or theologies. If that is the case, we could just we could justly regard biblical theology as a subvision of religion, as one aspect of human studies about God. A second way we study theology is historically. Historical theology does involve a study of what people who are not inspired agents of revelation teach about God. We examine historical councils, creeds, and writings of theology, the, theologians such as Augustine, Thomas, Aquinas, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Karl Barth, and others. We study various theological traditions to learn how each one understood the content of biblical theology. On the other hand, this may be called a study of religion in the sense that it is the study of religious thought. We may be motivated to study historical theology merely to understand the, historic, the history of religious thinking. In this scenario, the subject matter is human opinion. Or we may be motivated to study historical theology to learn what others have learned about God. In this scenario, the subject matter is God and the things of God. Of course, we would be motivated to study historical theology by a com combination of these two or for other reasons. The point is that we can have either a theological interest primarily or a religious interest as long as we recognize that they are not identical. <sighs> the study of nature. A third way of studying theology is by studying nature for its clues it gives about God's character. This we call natural theology. Natural theology refers to information about God that is gleaned from nature. People approach natural theology from two distinct vantage points. First, there are those who view natural theology as theology derived from sheer human speculation. By unaided reason, reflecting philosophically on nature. Second are those who, in accord with the historic approach to natural theology, see it as the product of and based on natural revelation. Revelation is something God does. It is the action of self-disclosure. Natural theology is something we acquire. It is the result of either human speculation or viewing na nature as a neutral object in itself, or of human reception of information given by the Creator in and through His creation. The second approach views nature as nature not as neutral object in itself that is mute, but as the theater of divine revelation, where information is transmitted through the created order. 
From the 16th century until the beginning of the 20th, no Reformed theologian I know of denied the, the denied the validity of natural theology derived from a natural revelation. The strong and antipathy in our day to theology based on unaided human speculation has brought in its wake a widespread and wholesale rejection of all un, all natural theology. This departure, in part of a reaction against Enlightenment rationalism, is a dis, is a departure from historic Reformed theology and from biblical theology. Both Roman Catholicism and historic Reformed theology embrace natural theology gleaned from na natural revelation. The reason for this substantial agreement is because the Bible, which both sides regarded as a special revelation, cr clearly teaches that, in addition to God's revelation of himself in Scripture, there is also the sphere of divine revelation found in nature. Classical theology made an acute distinction between special revelation and general revelation. The two kinds of revelation are distinguished by the term special and general because of the difference in content, scope, and in the audience of each. Special revelation is special because it provides specific information about God that cannot be found in nature. Nature does not teach us God's plan for salvation. Scripture does. We learn many more specifics about the character and activity of God from the scriptures than we can ever glean from creation. The Bible is also called special revelation because the information contained in it is unknown by people who have never heard the who have never read the Bible or had it proclaimed to them. General revelation is general because it reveals general truths about God and because its audience is universal, every person is exposed to some degree to God's revelation and creation. The most, the most, the most germane biblical basis for general or natural revelation is Paul's statement in Romans: "For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, from heaven against all ungodliness and all and." unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God they did not glorify him as God Romans 1 18 and 21 God directs his wrath to mankind because of their repression of natural revelation. God may be known because he has shown what may be shown about himself. This showing or revealing is manifest or clear. In creation, God's invisible attributes, through, though invisible, invisible, are clearly seen. That is, they are seen by or through the things that God made. This is almost universally understood to mean that God clearly reveals himself in and through natural through nature that is that there is a general or natural revelation. Does, does this manifest revelation get through to us and yield any knowledge of God? Paul does not leave us in doubt. He says this divine revelation is seen and understood. To see and understand something is to have some kind of knowledge about it. Paul says that they knew God, making it plain that natural revelation yields a natural theology or a natural knowledge of God. God's wrath is present not because men fail to receive his natural revelation, but because after receiving this knowledge, mankind fails to act appropriately. They refuse to honor God or be grateful to him. They suppress the truth of God, and as Paul later says, they do not like to retain God in their knowledge. Romans 1, 28.
People reject natural knowledge they have they have of God. This rejection, however, does not annihilate either the revelation or the knowledge itself. The sin of mankind is in is in refusing to acknowledge the knowledge they have. They act against the truth that God reveals and they clearly receive. The believer who who acquiesces in special re revelation is now in a posture to respond properly in general revelation. In this regard, the Christian should be the most diligent student of both special and natural revelation. Our theology should be informed by both the Bible and nature. The two come from the same re revelatory source, God himself. The two revelations do not conflict. They reflect the harmony of God's self-disclosures. A final way we study theology is through speculative philosophical theology. This approach can be driven either by a prior or commi commitment to natural revelation or by a conscious attempt to counter natural revelation. The first is a is a le legitimate reason for the Christian. The second is an act of reason of treason against God based on the pretense of human autonomy. In all these various approaches, there can be a study of theology rather than a mere analysis of a religion. When we engage in the quest to understand God, it is theology. When our quest is limited to understanding how people react to theology, it is religion. Queen of the Sciences. The study of theology includes the study of mankind, but this is from a theological perspective. We could order our science as in figure one. There are many subdivisions of, this, of the discipline of theology, one of which is anthropology. The modern approach looks more like figure two, figure 0 0.2, in which theology is a subset of anthropolo anthropology. Polology. These two paradigms illustrate the difference between a theocentric view of man and an anthropocentric view of religion and God. In the classical curriculum, theology is the queen of the sciences, and all the other disciplines are her handmaid, maiden, handmaidens. In the modern curriculum, man is king, and the former queen is regulated to a peripheral status of in insignificance. In his, in his monumental work, No Place for Truth, David F. Wells writes, the disappearance of theology from the life of the church and the, and the orchestration of that disappeared by some of its leaders is hard to miss today, but oddly enough, not easy to prove. It is hard to miss in the evangel evangelical world, in the vacu vacuous worship that is so prevalent. For example, in the shift from God to the self, as the central focus of faith in the psychologized preaching that follows the shift and the e erosion of its conviction in its strident pragmatism and its, ab and its ability to think in incisively about the culture and its reveling in the, the irrational a man-centered view of theology. Citing Ian T. Ramsey, Wells speaks of our present, our present condition as a church without theology in the theology without God. A church without theology or a theology without God are simply not options for the Christian faith. One can have religion without God or theology, but one cannot have Christianity without them. Theology in, in religion at Sinai. To further il illustrate the difference between theology and religion, 
Let us examine briefly a famous incident in this in the history of Israel. In Exodus 24, we read, Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered its six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of, a mount, of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Exodus twenty four fifteen to 18 In this episode, Moses ascends the same mountain as he formerly visited amid smoke, thunder, and lightning. He was summoned to a meeting with God. The glory of God was manifest to the people as a consuming fire, but God himself was hidden from them, concealed by clouds. Moses entered the cloud cover. His mission was one of pure theology. He was pursuing God himself. In light of this display, we must assume that the people left behind were not atheists. Aware of God's reality and his saving work, they were not neither secularists nor liberals. They were the evangelicals of the day, recipients of special revelation and participants in the redemptive exodus. Later in this narrative, however, we read of a startling shift in their behavior. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as this for as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Exodus thirty two one. What follows is an unprecedented unprecedented act of apostasy, the making and worshipping of a golden calf. This was an extent this was an exercise in religion and one that focused its worship on a creature. When they made their priceless state-of-the-art calf, they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 32.4 Notice that this is a theological affirmation. They claim that the golden calf was God and that the calf had delivered them from bondage. This, theo this theology was blatantly false. It was also evidence that the false religion flows out of false theology. Their calf was idolatrous graven image, which exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and traded the glory of God for the glory of an artistic creation. There is much wrong here. In the first place, the bull was the sacred image of the heathen gods of Egypt. By making their own bull idol, Israel conformed their religion to the world around them. Their new religion was now relevant. They had a god that they could that they could control. They made it and they could discard and destroy it. The cow gave no law and demanded no obedience. It had no wrath or justice or holiness to be feared. It was deaf, dumb, and impotent. But at least they could not intrude on their fun and call them to judgment. This was a religion designed by men, practiced by men, and ultimately useless for men. Theirs was a theology and a religion without God. It had the elements of religious practice, but what was worshipped was not God. The true God had been stripped of his real character by the people's vacious theology. A further irony is seen in the reason for Moses' delay in returning from the mountains. From chapter 24 until this moment in chapter 32, Moses was deceiving detailed instructions from God. These instructions focused on one thing, true, worth, true worship. God was giving detailed commandments concerning the tabernacle, the Aaronic priesthood, the 
liturgy of worship in the sanctity of the Sabbath. While Moses was learning sound theology, the first man consecrated as high priest, Aaron, was build, was building an altar to a golden calf. God was instructing Moses in proper religion that is based on a theology based on a theology of truth. David F. Wells notes, in the past the doing of theology encompassed three essential aspects in both the church and the academy. One, a confessional element. Two, reflection on this confession. And three, the cultivation of a set of virtues that are grounded in the first two elements. When we speak of Reformed theology, we will view it from this historical perspective. We, we, we begin our study by asserting that a Reformed theology is first and foremost a theology. As a theology, it has confessional, reflective, and behavioral aspects. The rest of this book will examine why this theology is called Reformed, but, but not until we repeat once more that is a, it is a theology not merely a religion without theology, it is driven first and foremost by, a tr by its understanding of the character of God. So, that was the introduction. About 14 pages. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video, I really want to encourage you to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share it on Facebook, any other social media platform. So basically, whenever YouTube sees a subscriber watches my video, YouTube is more inclined to distribute my video to other people groups. So if someone is watching my video without subscribing, it would help tremendously if they did subscribe. If you're a regular viewer, please subscribe. It'll help, it'll help the channel grow. Maybe one day I can become full-time be an evangelist full-time doing YouTube and so this is a free way that you can support me is just by subscribing because you're already watching the content so why not subscribe and, and if you're a new viewer and if you liked the video uh, I just want to encourage you this is the content you're gonna be getting all the time it'll really help me out and I, re I would really appreciate it so thanks for watching this I appreciate you guys thank you have a blessed day